Um, I, I'm just going to open with a scripture just that sort of goes along. Um, Psalms 90 and 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And hopefully understand why I picked that by the end of it. Um, before I really dive into it, um, just for those that would like to look afterwards, um, there's two documentaries on YouTube that go into much more detail about much of this stuff. The first one is called The Creepy Line. By, it's by Jansen Media. Um, the title may sound a bit interesting, but it comes from a phrase or a policy that Google had that they would push their technology right up into what people would consider creepy, and that's as far as they'd push it. So that's where the term comes from. And then the second one is called Social Media Dangers Childhood 2.0. Um, that deals much more with children and the effects that it has on them and how, you know, it works in their lives. So, to start, I just wanted to tell this, it's a sort of a funny story about that happened to me a couple weeks ago, and just how we, uh, phones have changed our lives and how we view things. So, a couple weeks ago, I was sitting up where Terry is right now, and it was on a Sunday morning, and whoever was supposed to do PowerPoint wasn't here, wasn't able to do it, and so I was up there, and as on Sunday mornings, me and my wife have a Sunday school class that we teach during the preaching. So I was like, okay, I'll get Ben or Drake to come up and do it while I'm doing it. And so I text them a service starts. And they don't text me back. And so in my mind, you know, I'm having this discussion with myself. I'm like, they're in church. They shouldn't be on their phones. But at the same time, why aren't they responding to me and coming up? <laughs> because that's how technology has changed our lives, where we expect people to be always readily available to answer us immediately and to do things like that. And so while in church they shouldn't be on their phones, it's not that they can't be. And so I was like, why aren't they responding? Where 10 years ago or 15 years ago or more when we didn't all have phones, it would have been, okay, I have to wait for someone to come upstairs or try and get a hold of someone. They can go down and talk to them. But I was like, I can just text them. And of course they'll respond. But being, doing what they should be doing, they weren't on their phones. And so that's just a little thing, but it's how, it just shows you how our mindset has very much changed about how we communicate and how phones and social media have changed our lives. Um, the first thing that I think we need to realize when looking at social media, our phones and things of that nature is that if you are not paying for it, you are the product that is being sold. Um, if you do not pay for it, subscribe to it, you know, you are the product. Your time and your information is what is being sold to third parties. In, in 2017, just about 2.5 billion people were on social media. By last year, that number had risen to over 3.8, so just over half the world's population. Every second, 11 new people in our world log on to social media for the first time. So that means by now, so by now, well over 4 billion people are now on social media in our world. Um, just as an example of how much money these companies make, Facebook, Google, uh, and their owners are three of the 10 richest people on the planet, worth well over, most of them, $40 billion because of these companies where we purchase, for the vast majority of us, nothing from them, but we give them our time and our information and they have made vast fortunes. Um, everything they do from now, usually now, is so they can get more of our time and more of our information to better serve their advertisers and the ads that they can sell. When Google was first created, one of their goals and one of their statements was that you would spend as little time as possible on their website. They wanted you to get you on it and off it as much as possible, and that is what has made it made it so popular is that you'd get on it, you'd type what you wanted, and it would search very quickly, and they had a very revolutionizing algorithm that did it, and then you would get off Google and go to some another website. That was their goal. But they realized not too long afterwards that that was not the best way to, one, monetize what they were doing, and not the best way to gain your information. So they needed to get you to spend more time on Google products and they needed to create other ones so that they would gain more of your information. That's why they started creating things like Google Chrome, which is now the most popular web browser. 
Because if you just went into your computer and typed in a website, Google wouldn't know that you're going there because you didn't use Google. And therefore, you weren't on Google, and you weren't, they weren't gaining ad dollars, and they weren't also gaining that information. So they have totally revolutionized how they do things and totally changed it from the beginning to obviously make money and gain your information. Um, not only do they obviously collect enormous amounts of our data, but they also employ some of the smartest people in our world and pay them lots and lots of money to find better ways to interpret our data. And they are very, very, very good at it. Um, I remember, this is about, I want to say, it was seven years ago, not long after my wife and I were married, we went we were getting a US dollar visa card from the bank because we spent so much time in the States and it made, um, it makes, you know, converting money and paying for things in the States a lot easier and you pay less fees. But as we were sitting there, we were talking with the guy that we were applying it through and I just asked him a question. I was like, why do all these different companies have their own branded, you know, um, credit cards? So you'd see like, sign up with Tim Hortons, you can get benefits, but they have a Tim Hortons visa card or a Tim Hortons MasterCard. You know, all these different companies had those, and there's a couple reasons. One, they get, I think, a higher, they get more money from it if you buy it there, but they also get to see all of your purchases. They get to see your purchase history. And so, for a company like Tim Hortons, they want to see, okay, are you spending most of your, you know, coffee money at Tim Hortons? Or are you splitting it between Tim Hortons and Starbucks? When are you buying it? Things of that nature. So they can better serve and realize what you want. And so, and they got very, very good at interpreting this data. And this is 10 years ago, and you can just imagine how far algorithm comes since then, but they realized, and this is where they got into trouble, is that there is a 15-year-old girl whose dad had given her, you know, her own card, it was in his name and it went to his account, but she had her own purchase history. And they realized that before even buying things like diapers and direct baby things, that the things that she was buying meant that she was more than likely pregnant as a 15-year-old girl. And she had not yet told her dad, but the, the company started sending her directed advertisements for things like a cribs and diapers and baby food. And the dad being, you know, a parent was like really upset because he's like, why are you sending these things to my daughter? Well, they were sending them because their algorithm realized by what she was purchasing that she was pregnant. Even though she hadn't told him yet, they knew she was pregnant. And so they were sending her. And this was probably 10 years ago. And they've gotten much, much better and they do it much, much faster by tracking your browser history. Another example, um, this time last year and last year, um, me and Tony, we were looking at different um, social, um, compu um, tracking monitors to mount the camera on. Um, that we have one now, we haven't put it up yet, and we were looking at different ones, and lots of them were related to church media. And within the next day, on YouTube, if I was watching a video, there was a good chance that I was going to get an ad about some sort of church worship software. A day later, just because they realized my browser history, the things I've been looking at, and they start sending you targeted ads. And so your information and what you look at is very, very valuable for them. That is why they want to track it and keep you on their products as much as possible. It's gotten to the point now where most of the time they probably know more about you than anybody else sitting in this room. It's true. When you think about it, if you're feeling sick and you haven't told anybody yet, you look the symptoms up online and they tell you what you might have and they know that you're sick. If you're going through marital problems and you look for a counselor or you look for a lawyer before you tell anybody else, they know. They know almost everything about you because we search about it and we look at it. And it's scary in a way, but they know so much about you. Um, Another way to show the value of this monetary information is the strategy that Facebook has taken in much of the third world. What they have done is, in these countries, fast, reliable home internet is not available. So most of the time, in these markets, they're emerging phone markets, and people spend almost all of their internet time is on their phone. They don't have computers. They don't have home internet. And so they went and made deals with the telecommunication companies, the Rogers and Bell and all of that 
of those countries and said, if you sell the phones with Facebook on them and all different products of Facebook, then we'll also make a deal with you and pay you money if you make it so that when they use Facebook products on their phone, we, you will not charge them data for it. And so for us, if we go watch a video you know, on our data, it doesn't make a difference if we watch it on Facebook or YouTube or whatever, we use the same amount of data. But they want everybody to go to Facebook. And so for these people, where you have limited data and there's no other way they don't have home internet to watch it, why not go to Facebook if I'm not gonna be charged for it? Because there, I'm not gonna waste my data. And so they drive people to their websites. And you, you know, it's like, well, that must be really expensive for them to use that much data when you realize these are huge emerging cell phone markets, places like India and South America where there are lots of people getting phones. But your information and the time you spend is much more valuable to them than the money they have to pay these companies to get them to do that because it's so valuable to them. Um, social media companies make money of us by, using, by us using their apps and the info they gather and they've designed these to make us spend as much time on them as possible. Um, Peter Mizek, um, an app developer, said this, the, sec the success of an app is often measured by the extent to which it introduces a new habit to people. So the success is, do people form a new habit to use it? That which is what makes it successful. Not even, there's not even a monetary value originally tied to it. It's like, do people create a new habit to check it every day or check it every hour? That's what determines is it successful or not. Um, so they want you going back to your phones and these as much as possible. Last year, a study done in the US found that people on a day that they were not working, when often we are, you know, we can't check our phones because our bosses will be mad at us. They, on average, people check their phones 80 times a day with many checking it of the younger generation over 300 times a day they check their phone. And just to do some math for you, if you check your phone 300 times a day, that means you check it just under every five minutes, assuming you don't sleep. That means you check it every five minutes if you stay up for 24 hours, if you check it 300 times. And many people check it more than that. That's how much these phones and this has come into our lives. We have, com we have cr created a compulsion and a habit that affects us even in the middle of the night. Um, I don't know, some of you may know who Joe Rogan is, but he uh, has the biggest podcast in the world. And I was listening to one with him on it, and he was talking about um, a situation that happened with him and his youngest daughter. So he's a fitness nut and all that kind of stuff and uses a Fitbit. And so his youngest daughter asked for a Fitbit. And one thing that it does is it tracks your sleep habits. And so being a uh, parent, you can sit, you know, sync it up to your own phone so you get the information on what they do. And he checked it you know, after the first couple nights and he realized that now she was up in the middle of the night checking her Fitbit cause you, or, or, and her phone in the middle of the night. And so he was like, well, we're gonna get rid of these. And then so as young people, you know, we try and, well, it's not that important to me. And he looked at her and he's like, well, if it's not that important, then it's not a big deal if I'm taking it away. But we have created a compulsion to check these things and to try and hide it from people that we know will be disapproving of it. Um, there's a podcast by, um, um, that has a, a doctor named Leonard Sachs on it, and he's a child physician. And he has dealt with these types of issues, among many others, with children that we're dealing with now. And he, has a, he had a question and answer period with um, a, a parent afterwards. And his recommendation is that there should be no phones in kids' bedrooms whatsoever, and that you should go back to using an actual alarm clock. Because, you know, you get up, you wake up in the middle of the night, I do it, I check my phone to see what time it is, to see how much more time I can sleep. And then you see, okay, someone call me, someone text me, and your, your inclination is to check it. It may just be them sharing something funny with you that you don't even, it's not even important. But the compulsion is I gotta check it, you engage your brain, and then it's harder to go back to sleep. And so this parent got up and said, well, you know what, my daughter tells me that, she, and I'm not going to talk about kids very much, but this story just illustrates the purpose of kids with phones, but adults do much of the same thing, got up and said, well, you know, I talked to my daughter and she tells me she doesn't use the phone in the middle of the night. And him being, he's not trying to be confrontational, but he looked at her and said, 
with all due respect, the child is mo- they're, they're most likely to lie to you because they don't want to disappoint you, right? They don't want you to know that you're, they know you don't want them up in the middle of the night looking at their phone, so they're not going to tell you that they're up in the middle of the night on their phone. They're going to tell you that they're not. But we also do the same thing where we're like, well, it's not going to affect me that much if I look at my phone, but if you look at people's sleep habits and things like that, they've gone gotten much worse over the years instead of much better. Um, So we spend lots of times on our phone and we pick them up way too much. And I'll talk about it a little bit later, but I honestly think the amount of times we pick them up is probably worse than the amount of time we actually spend on them. But in North America, the average time spent on social media a day is two hours and six minutes which is right in line with the world average. Um, some, in some places, like, um, it's hot, much higher um, based on an, uh, quite a few things. But based on this number, if you started using social media at the age of 10, which many now are, they get phones at that age, and having an average lifespan of about 72 years, you would spend 3,426,390 minutes using social media. That's about six years and eight months of your life spent on social media. The only things that we could reliably say that you would do more in your life are sleep and work or whatever your career is. That is the only thing now that we can reliably say that a child that gets to start social media, even at probably 15, would spend doing more in their life is their sleep and their career. That's it. Everything... And that's not even including the amount of time in this study that kids spent watching TV, which now most of the time is done on phones. So it's even more than that. And the other really horrendous thing about this is that that is four to five times more time spent than actual meaningful social interaction that we need. So that that amount of time would be about a year and a half that you get in your life, and you get over six years of meaningless or much less meaningful social interaction online. So psychologists estimate that as many as 10% of Americans meet the criteria for having a social media addiction, not just a bad habit, but a true addiction. Social media addiction is a behavioral addiction that is characterized as being overly concerned about social media, driven by an uncontrollable urge to log in or to see social media, and devoting so much time and effort to social media that it impairs other important areas of our life. And based on the other numbers, I'd probably say it's much higher than 10%. Addictive social media use will look much like other substance um, use disorder, including mood modifications, uh, tolerance and that you need to use it more and more to get the same thing, withdrawal symptoms. All this comes from people using social media. The phenomena of social media addiction can largely be contributed to the dopamine-inducing social environments that the social networking sites provide. That means when you get likes or texts or whatever, your dopamine spikes. Um, Social media platforms such as Facebook, Snapchat, and Instagram produce the same neural circuitry that is caused by gambling and recreational drug use by using things like, you know, the constant strolling and other things to keep you engaged. Studies have shown that the constant stream of retweets, likes, and shares from these sites have affected the brain's reward area to trigger the same kind of chemical reaction as other drugs such as cocaine. In fact, neuroscientists have compared social media interaction to a syringe of dopamine during being injected straight into the system. And so it has, it has a dramatic effect on the body. Your dopamine spikes by about 400% when you get the text or like that you're hoping for but didn't know you're going to receive. So when you get a, a like on your post that you didn't know if you're going to get, your dopamine spikes. When you get a text from someone that you didn't know you're going to get it from, um, your dopamine spikes. Um, much le- it is much like the slot machine effect where you know you sit and you pull and you pull and you pull and you know what you're hoping for the outcome to be and you get a huge rush when it comes. Um, there was an interesting study done many years ago with pigeons, but it relates very much to the same way how our brain works. Um, they, they put 
these pigeons in a cage, and there was two different buttons they could push that would give them food. One, every time you pushed it, it would give you, um, if I remember right, two bits of food. And the other one, about every 10 times, would give you 15 bits of food. And so if you do the math, if you just press it 10 times, you get 20 bits of food. But they would constantly press the other one because the spike of getting 15 is more, is more enjoyable for the brain and more enjoyable to the body than just getting the constant number. And also, the ones that would just have the two, they would only press it as much as they needed. So they would push it, eat, push it, eat, and when they're full, they would stop pushing it. But the other ones, they would just keep pushing it and keep pushing it, waiting for the spike to come back. Because there was a rush that came when, oh, food's coming. They wouldn't even eat all the food, but there was something chemically that happened even in their brains that, oh, if I keep pushing this, more will come. And it's the same way with us. When we scroll and we scroll and we scroll, we get a spike of, oh, the, I like that, or someone liked my picture. It's a spike, and we keep going. We don't know if we have to scroll for another two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, but it's, it's the unknown and then the spike that really gets us addicted. Um, and these companies have spent tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, making these as um, addictive to our brains as possible. Um, so, we spend too much time on them, and, but it's the constant checking that has maybe a much more detrimental effect on our brains um, than the amount of, just the raw amount of time. Because if I set aside you know, and I just sit down and I'm like, you know what, I have an hour, I'm going to do something on YouTube. It only affects that hour. And then if I can put that phone down and not pick it back up, it only affects that hour. But what is happening is we are constantly interrupting our day and constantly unfocusing our mind to check our phones. And it is making us much less productive and a much less fo uh, focused um, generation. There's a doctor, Cal Newport, he's written two very good books, one called Digital Minimalism. He's a digital minimalist, doesn't have social media. He's a professor in the US, but he also has another book called Deep Work. And he realized this a few years ago and wrote this book, and the book is about, in our world now that is increasingly based on skills that you have and very segregated based on skills that, okay, you're an electrician or you're a plumber or whatever, the thing that differentiates between the electricians and the plumbers in their fields is their ability to focus and work hard and not be distracted because we all realize that when we were able to focus on a task, we work better. Some of us are better at multitasking than others. Some of us are horrible and some of us can do two tasks at the same time better than others. But we all, I think, would realize that if we focus on one task for an extended period of time, we do much better than if we don't. And even just the... 30 seconds it takes to look at their phone after it buzzes, read a text and respond, it severely hamp uh, dampens our ability for our brains to focus and now we have to spend time getting back to that amount of time focusing. And when we think about the numbers that we read before or quoted before about the amount of times we're checking our phones, we're truly not getting our brains to focus and to be able as effective as we need to be. And obviously this is devastating in a business or a work sense, but it also is devastating in a spiritual sense that if we want to focus in prayer or focus in study or focus in whatever, our minds are always being pulled back to my phone and we're like, oh, I'm in the middle of prayer. What is it? You know, someone texts me, I look at it, I read it, but it takes you out of the vein of thought that you're in or the, the vein of prayer that you're in. And so it affects how we can, um, deeply we can get into that. Um, one of the last things I want to talk about is gone pretty fast. Um, our brains need time to process the information that we put into them. Our brains were not wired to always be inputting information. They were designed to have downtime, to have quiet time, to have time to think and process information. And honestly, we need much more of that than we need time inputting information. But because of phones, especially in social media, we have almost no time now where our, our brains are not inputting information, whether it's videos or texts or reading or whatever from a screen. Our brains are always taking in information. And this is what a lot of experts are saying that's really led to lots of social anxiety and depression along with 
detrimental social media use in young people is because their brains are always exhausted and they're never actually getting the time they need to grow and think. And if you, you know, 15, 20 years ago or, and before, there was a lot more time for quiet time in our lives. You know, you look at, and I'm guilty of it, you look at a lot of young people, they even, you go to the grocery store, you put a headphone in. You stand in line, you have something inputting into your brain. Before, you're at a long line in the store, you have 10 minutes with just your own thoughts to think. And your brain needs that time. And one of the things I've, you know, they're talking about is that, you know, that's one thing that really provokes people to deal with the hard issues of life is that you need time to sit and think about it, and your brain fo forces you to think about and deal with them. And, you know, 15, 20 years ago and before, if you wanted to avoid dealing with them, you had to go to substances or alcohol. That People went to those to avoid dealing with those issues because they didn't want to deal with life and deal with what would needed to try and solve those situations in life. But now we have a device in our pockets that allows us to, whenever we want to, avoid those situations. My brain wants me to deal with this issue that I'm working through at work or in my personal life. Well, I don't want to deal with that right now. I pull up my phone, I click on YouTube, I click on social media, and my brain immediately can let go of it because now something's going into my brain and now it's focusing on that. And so our brains need that time to deal with all the information that is happening in life and to help us to grow but now we are able to banish all times of boredom, like, for lack of a better term, of boredom that we need to grow as people. Um, um, who, has anybody here heard of, um, it's called, there's, Henry David Thoreau wrote a book about his experiences at a place called the Walden Pond, and it became he, he, uh, Thoreau's New Economics. Has anybody ever heard of that? And so, um, I've heard exactly when the book was written, but Henry David Thoreau, what he did was, um, he went out and built himself a little house beside a pond, and what he did is he figured out the exact amount of work that he needed to do to provide for his bare necessities, to have a house, food, warmth, shelter. He figured out the bare necessities of what he needed to do. And after doing all the numbers, he realized that he only needed to work one day a week. This was probably about 100 years ago. And so he's like, and he, he, he thought about it more in the concepts of time than money. And he's like, well, I could go work to buy a car, but would the time I need to work to buy the car save me as much time as it does to walk into the grocery store and get the groceries I need and come home? And so what he did is he changed it from how much money do I need to make to how much time am I using and is it worth the money that I am getting? And so he said, um, and so... And so he realized for his life, he only needed to work one day a week. And so this is what someone said, the magician's trick of shifting the units of measure from money to time is the core novelty of what philosopher Frederick Gross calls Thoreau's new economics, a theory that builds on the following axiom, which Thoreau established early in the book called Walden. The cost of a thing is the amount of which I will call life which is required to be exchanged for it immediately or in the long run. Not how much I have to pay for it, but how much of my life do I have to spend to get it? So do I have to spend four days at work to pay for this? Or if I get, just take a car for example. We all would like, let's, you know, everybody, you, you could work, you know, yourself to the bone and buy a brand new Ferrari, let's say. But you could work much less and have a much more beneficial life and drive a Toyota Camry. Let's use that as an example. What is, what is more valuable to you? Is the time you spent getting the car more valuable or is the time that you knew, now have more valuable? And I think that's how we much more need, and he's using it in economic sense is working with money, but I think we need to take that principle and look at it with social, not only social media, but other areas in our life, is what are we spending the time in? Is it giving us value for the time that we are doing it? Is it bringing us value? And don't get me wrong, I understand that, that we all need leisure time and time to just go do something sometimes that are just fun and they don't even, they don't bring any concrete value. But when you look at the other when the numbers that I read, we are spending much too time, much too much time doing things that bring us absolutely or very, very little value. 
in a world where everybody says that we don't have time. We don't have enough time. Um, we put our time into the things that we begin to treasure. And I was thinking about this earlier, but if you look at it, about 10 years ago, that's when the social media really started changing, when Facebook really changed its focus from gaining a user base to making it profitable and getting us much of our time. The amount of time spent on social media has more than doubled in the last 10 years. And I'm, I was just, I was 20 years old 10 years ago, and if you'd asked me, you know, or asked any of us that if we had the amount of time, most of us said we were busy and didn't have enough time 10 years ago. But our world has somehow found the time to double the amount of time we spend on social media. So what have we sacrificed even in the last 10 years in progress, in growth, in whatever, because of the amount of time we spent on social media? And all of this is just thinking about it physically, not even spiritually. When you start thinking about the old patriarchs of faith, and even in the early 1900s, most of them, when they're described, one of the things that describes is the amount of time and focus they would put in things like prayer. And the things that now we would, you know, too many of us would say, we just don't have time. And it's not necessarily true. It's that we have put our treasure in other things, and that's where we've put our time. Um, and so I'm going to close with this. Thoreau's rigor in applying these economic insights in his own life is, was powerfully unique in his time where he sacrificed much of the modern conference because he was alive during the technical revolution about 100 years ago where things were really starting to change and inspires many today to think through what matters most and to count the costs. It's a perennially important lesson taught long before, but it was a lesson taught long before either Thoreau or the economists that have thought about it and it was by Jesus Christ who admonished us in Matthew 6 and 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I want to start, and I believe that the Lord is here to help us tonight. I believe that this is very, very important teaching. I believe that the church shouldn't be in a bubble, that we need to confront and address these topics that, uh, that we're listening here tonight. I believe that God is going to help us, and uh, I believe every little bit of this is very important. I want to start with a scripture, Psalm 127 and 3. It says, Lo, children are an heritage, an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Children are so very special to the Lord. And children are special to me. I've got three young kids in this place, and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of beautiful children in this church, and we love them all. The digital age, there's going to be a lot of information here uh, tonight, obviously, and there's going to be some cross-referencing. Uh, you're going to hear some information a little bit, uh, probably over a couple of times, but it's just going to cement this into your mind. But the digital age has exposed children and young teens to all kinds of threats on the internet thanks to the ease of smartphone access. Little knowledge, however, is conveyed to kids regarding the dangers on the internet. As more and more kids connect to the internet, the chances of cyber stalking, online bullying, and all kinds of other dangers have significantly increased over the years. That is why raising awareness in this type of setting is so important. It's essential for youth and children, both in and out of the church, to stay secure on the web. For those of us who grew up in the Stone Age, uh, waiting for a free phone line, it's hard to comprehend the constant state of connectivity and online access that is available to our kids today. Parents are tasked with establishing boundaries and overseeing their online safety, and this can be a major challenge. While there is nothing inherently wrong with electronic devices or smartphones, there are many dangers that can go along with it, dangers the church must confront and battle. Parents have to deal with technologies today that our parents never had to deal with. Technology which can benefit our lives in so many ways can also be quite dangerous as it can effectively expose the privacy of our children. Topping the list is the easy accessibility of smart devices and apps which are exposing kids to the growing online threats. Parents today have the task of protecting our children both online and offline in the real world. It's not just the dangers of social media, but the effect that too much screen time can have on young minds. 
Over the last 15 months or so, our kids have been mainly homeschooled due, due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Those that were spent roughly seven or eight hours, I know our kids did, seven to eight hours sometimes every day on a computer or, or other smart device. So we need to be dil a village, village, a vigilant rather more than ever before about the amount of screen time that our children and teens are spending online. Approximately two billion people use a smartphone or a smart device every day for work, scheduling, organizing their busy lives with punctual reminders, calendars, and so many helpful apps. Smart devices easily override our attention spans. One recent study showed that participants underestimated their device usage by about 50%. So whatever you think you're using your phone, however much time you think you're spending, double that. Technology, it seems, is lending itself to a shorter attention spans. In 2015, several major news sources reported that we now have the attention span less than that of a goldfish. This study, of course, wasn't uh, peer-reviewed. And on a lighter note, in a follow-up study, 9 out of 10 goldfish were offended by being referenced to that previous study. That study was also not peer-reviewed. <laughs> but thankfully, from the evidence that we currently have, electronic devices do not seem to be shrinking our attention span. We're just more distracted, more distracted than ever before. What does seem clear is that electronic devices, especially smartphones, are addictive and can easily distract us from the very tasks that they purport to simplify. Electronic devices are hijacking, they're stealing our attention. The same seems to be even more so for children and for youth. 2013, a survey of Canadian kids in grades 4 through to grade 11 found that 99% of children, Canadian children, had access to the internet outside of school. Cell phones and smartphones were the primary devices that kids used to access the internet. 66% had their own device. 60% of parents admitted that their children under 13 were accessing social media and other messaging platforms, and we'll get into the dangers of that later. More than half of students in grade 11 said they sleep with their phones, just in case they get a text or a call in the middle of the night. 20% of grade 4 students found my little girl with a, a phone in her bed, uh, but 20% of grade 4 students <laughs> said they do the same. 60% of boys in this age group access the internet through gaming consoles like Sims, IMVU, Drake, please don't, uh, please forgive me if I, if I, if I am mispronouncing these, um, IMVU, brother, <laughs> uh, and Fortnite. All have built-in messaging tools. Strangers attempt to lure kids not only on social media platforms, but gaming environments as well. Wherever there is an opportunity to connect with children through messaging, this is where we need to be careful. These statistics are of a great concern considering the dangers, dangers directed at this age group from online predators often posing as friends, acquaintances, or other children in the same age group. The most immediate threat is the one that is posed from most social media apps. The growing dangers or the growing threat of sextortion and easy accessibility of pornography also pose great dangers, grave dangers. So I want to break this up into two components here. I want to talk about the internal threats of social media and too much screen time on youth and children, and then I want to talk about the external threats. Internal threats, several studies have linked parental excessive use of screen time to an increase in poor behavior in children. It's an interesting to see it from that perspective. But an increase in parents' excessive use of screen time to an increase in their child's poor behavior. These include frustration, hyperactivity, and tantrums. It is generally accepted by scholars that technology is changing the way that we think, memorize, and focus. We no longer need to remember birthdays, uh, special occasions, phone numbers, important dates, whatever it might be. All the information is just a Google or Siri search away. How many times have we said, hey Siri? How many times have we, have we just plugged in Google? Studies have shown that we are more likely to use Google than to answer from memory. But this memory outsourcing comes at a, at a cost. Uh, 
Devices are not only changing the way that we think, but even more concerning, they are hijacking our attention. While it doesn't seem that if smart devices are any more distracting than, let's say, sports or other hobbies or work, we have access or the ability to access anything at any time, anywhere, right at our fingertips. Devices can be a serious impediment to our spiritual lives and to the spiritual lives of our kids. Amen? Consider this. Health Matters article out of the New York Presbyterian. Uh, nearly half of all American children, I would believe that would mean, is that uh, nearly half of all children under eight have their own tablet device and spend an average of about two and a quarter hours a day on those devices. It's even higher now. With the COVID-19 pandemic and children being homeschooled, that number has soared. What is all this screen time doing to kids' brains? Well, early data from a landmark National Institute of Health study that began in 2018 indicates that children who spent more than two hours a day on screen time activities scored lower on language and thinking tests. Some children with more than seven hours a day experienced a thinning of the brain's cortex, the area of the brain that is used in critical thinking and reasoning. So it is affecting our kids' brains our kids' minds. We know that from these studies that we have easy access to screens now more than ever, but how do screens affect early childhood development? One way is that it could inhibit certain, this is a quote, inhibit certain aspects of a child's development by narrowing their focus of interest and limiting their other means of exploration and learning, a sort of tunnel vision, if you will. The study from the NIH, or National Institute of Health, stated that young children who spend most of their time engaging in computers or other devices had difficulty engaging in non-electronic activities, such as playing with toys to foster imagination and creativity, exploring outdoors, and playing with other children to, ve to develop age-appropriate social skills. For young children, especially those under the age of three, development is happening at such a rapid rate. Young children learn by exploring their environment and watching the adults in their life and imitating them. Excessive screen time may inhibit a child's, a child's ability to observe and experience the typical everyday activities they need to engage with in the world that they live in. This can lead to a type of tunnel vision which can be detrimental to their overall development. So how does excessive screen time impact a child's ability to learn? Studies have shown that children under two learn less from a video than when learning from another person. Although children will watch screens by six months, understanding the content does not generally occur developmentally until after the age of two. It's not that they won't be captivated, captivated by what they're seeing, they just won't comprehend it. They're not learning from it. Language development expands rapidly between the ages of one and a half and three years of age. Children learn language best when they're engaging and interacting with adults, when they're talking and playing with them. There's some, uh, also some evidence that children who had excessive screen time during their early elementary school years did not perform as well on reading tests and showed deficits in attention, as you alluded to earlier. Now this is the heavier part of, of, of this, and uh, I've had a bit of a, a challenge with this, but it's, it's, it's a very heavy subject matter, um, but God is here, and I want to talk about some of the external threats that, uh, that are facing our children and youth online. With schools and, and playgrounds uh, closed and extracurricular act, uh, curricular activities canceled, kids are heading to the internet for their classes and to pass time. They're logging in to play games, connect with friends, and to check the internet or the latest posts on Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, whatever you want. Because of the repeated lockdowns, people are uh, online and children are spending an inordinate amount of time, a crazy amount of time in front of screens, whether those are computers or mobile devices. Police in Canada are warning parents that sexual predators are talking amongst themselves. About how children are home all day, every day spending more time online than ever before because of the pandemic 
And that is something that they're excited about. They're very eager to take advantage of children. Police say predators are using sophisticated techniques to connect with young people wherever they can find them online. They often impersonate young youth or impersonate a youth around the victim's age. Predators draw them into explicit conversations uh, and convince some youth to share photos and videos. Some of these predators capture those videos and share them with each other. There's a, a community of predators online, a vast community of predators online. They might also att attempt to extort the victim through force and through th uh, threats to obtain more images uh, or even money. This is according to the Canadian Centre for Child Protection. Some will even try to meet with children in public spaces. Police and experts say abusers have been taking advantage of children spending more time online. Since the pandemic started last March, screen time for children and youth has gone up over 200%. According to the RCMP, abusers and those seeking to exploit children sexually can be found wherever children hang out online. They're hanging out on every platform, whether it's Facebook, Microsoft, Google, Snapchat, any platform where they're going to find children. You're going to find this type of material that is being reported to the police. The CBC states that Canadian kids are spending more time online due to the pandemic, and that is driving a spike in reports of online exploitation of children. Stephen Sawyer, director of cybertip.ca, said his organization saw an 81% spike over April, May, and June of 2020 in reports of youth who had been sexually exploited or attempted exploitation of minors, an 81% increase. It seems to be an epidemic right now online, he stated. The police reports from Canadians alone exploiting, uh, exploiting children of Canadians from Canadians alone exploiting children and sharing child pornography has surged to several thousand per month, up from, up from 500 a month on the average since the beginning of the pandemic, up about 200%. Charges related, charges related to online exploitation are way up as well as reported incidents to the authorities, which are also way up. This is a level of activity, quote, that has been unparalleled in the existence of the ICE, which is the Internet Child Exploitation Unit, said Dwayne Lacusta with the Internet uh, Child Exploitation Unit in Alberta. Canada is not alone. Globally, human traffic, I, 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 it pains me to even say it, Jesus help. Human trafficking alone is a $150 billion a year industry, with the average age of those being recruited are young girls between the ages of 11 and 14. It's my daughter's age. It doesn't get to you, I don't know what will. 76% of the transactions for sex with minor females takes place online before it ever happens out in the world. Boys are not safe either. Abusers are looking for those that can be easily manipulated, and they're looking for the most vulnerable. The sad truth is that 40 million people worldwide are the victims of human trafficking. This is greater than the population of our country. 40 million people. And the average age, 11 to 14 year old. Law enforcement around the world claim that at any given moment, there are over 50,000 sexual predators online. Any given moment. Internet predators are predators that groom. They come in many shapes and forms, and very rarely are they ever who they pretend to be. They cultivate relationships and, uh, with a child online and then have the child come to them so that they don't have to take the risky approach of locating the child to abduct them. Because that would be too dangerous. Europol, the EU's central law enforcement agency, also found an increase in the sharing of child sexual abuse material in record levels online during the pandemic. The bottom line is that screen time is way up. People being at home in all of these lockdowns, we are, we are confronting a major threat to our children. 
anytime that they log on. According to the U.S. National uh, Center for Missing and Exploited Children, there has been a 106% increase in such activity across the globe. Our children's innocence is at stake every time our children go online. Every time our children go online. I was shocked to find out that 90% of children ages 8 to 16 had viewed pornography online. 70% of them accidentally, accidentally encountered that material while keying in innocent terms or online search terms for homework. According to ChildGuard, an online child protection service, which compiled a massive amount of information from dozens of online sources, the number one consumer of online pornography are children between the ages of 12 and 17. 20% of all pornography involves children, and every week, 20,000 new images are uploaded to the internet. So this is a real problem. This is a very real problem. Our, child, our children's innocence is at stake. We need to be concerned. Social media and electronic devices on its own are not the real danger, but it's the manner in which they can be used which poses the real problem. The national campaign, this is going to get under your feathers, young people. The national campaign, wait until 8th, suggests waiting until they're in the 8th grade to give them a phone. It suggests waiting until they're 16 to give them access to data. The potential negative emotional and developmental effects of smartphones and social media use is the reason for this suggestion. Wait until 8th provides the following study proven reasons to wait. They interfere with school, uh, school work and grades, they're addictive, they're changing childhood. Children are losing their innocence is what that is saying. They're increasing anxiety and depression, they interfere with sleep, and they can expose children to unwanted content. We need to be vigilant every time our children connect to the internet. It's easy for our kids to download free apps, but they may not realize that there are risks involved with using this seemingly innocent technology, and parents are often unaware of the dangers that are associated with these seemingly innocuous apps. Many apps can expose kids to the possibility of online bullying, and when using anonymous chat apps, they are vulnerable to predators. Parents need to know what apps are targeted for teens. So the Newport Academy, a teen rehab and mental health treatment center, lists some of the most dangerous apps, and I have a, a, a print off here that you can look at or, or even take with you, lists some of the most dangerous apps for parents to monitor. Snapchat, Ask FM, TikTok, Whisper, Kick Messenger, Tinder, Instagram, Omegle, Telegram, Blender, Periscope, House Party, Voxer, Hala, Tumblr, Visco, Big O Live, and WeChat. I have hardly heard of any of those, and I thank God for that. I do. Let's take a look at some of the risks that are involved with just a few of these, okay? Snapchat. Snapchat has millions of users from, the ground, from around the globe. Back in 2014, the website, uh, the app was hacked, and a large number of personal photos were, uh, were, were taken and were publicized. The app does destruct the snaps, but there's a short window or a short period of time where people, anonymous people, can take screenshots of the snap and later exploit it for their own purposes. TikTok has around 500 million active users worldwide. 13 is the minimum age required to use the app. Anyone can download it because there's no proper way to verify the user's age. Another concern for parents is the inappropriate language used in some videos, which is not suitable for kids on this app. TikTok accounts are public by default, means that anybody can view the videos upload, uploaded by your children and get in touch with them. Whisper, check this one out. Whisper is a confession app where anyone can make confessions while being anonymous. Users can communicate with any other Whisper user by living nearby. The app uses GPS location. It uses a GPS location tracker to track users nearby. The app, although it keeps these, the user's identity anonymous, it does show the location of the area from where the message, uh, messages are being sent. As a result, any online predator can pinpoint the location, and in fact, 2013, that did happen where a young girl was abducted. Kick Messenger. 
The app lacks age, age verification and can be downloaded by kids who are younger than 13. Since users of any age can, uh, can get access to the app, cyber stalkers and even pedophiles can get the opportunity to find young kids and compel them into sending more risky photos or their personal information. Tinder, the app uses GPS location tracker again to show other Tinder uh, users living nearby. It's most often used by teens and tweens. Since the app is quite popular amongst, the, uh, amongst teens, predators can create fake profiles. Fake profiles to lure unsuspecting users to hit a conversation and then meet up. Omegle is designed, Omegle is another one designed to facilitate online conversations with random strangers. Experts agree that it's one of the most dangerous, dangerous apps for kids, but they're using it anyways. Users can text or video chat with people from more than 190 countries around the world. According to Common Sense Media, interactions on Omegle can easily result in conversations that are filled with explicit content, lewd language, and references to drugs, alcohol, and violence. Blender, a flirting app, uses GPS tracking. Hala, a video chat app, randomly connects users to strangers from across the globe. Commonly, they, they have access to violence, profanity, nudity, pretty common on the app. Uh, Tumblr, according to Common Sense Media, it's too raunchy for, for young kids. Inappropriate, violent, pornographic content is easily accessible to users. And so on. It goes on and on and on and on. These are the threats and the dangers that our children are facing every time that they log online. Unattended, when they are doing things behind closed doors, when they say that they are not. These are the real risks that our kids are facing. So what can we do? What can parents do? This is the last part, and this is the most important part. Because we love our kids, and we want our kids to be safe. Always. Don't we? There are so many threats in this world, in this real world, and then we have to confront this real danger. It's even a more imminent danger of their online life. So the number one thing that we can do here in this place, the best thing that we can do, is to pray for our kids. Pray for our kids. Lay hands on them and pray for them. Plead the blood of Jesus over them. Don't assume that because your child spends a few hours a week in church that he or she is immune from these online dangers. We live in the real world. We live in the real world. An online predator, don't tell me that an online predator cares that your child spends a few hours in church a week. I don't think that Christians should live in a bubble, as I said before. I believe that God will protect our children, but it is our obligation as parents to be vigilant. Every night I plead the blood of Jesus Christ over our kids, their minds, their hearts, their eyes, and their ears, because I want them to be protected from the things that can harm them, and there are so many, to protect above all to protect their innocence, to keep their innocence for as long as their innocence can be kept. We want to encourage our children. These are the things that we can do. We want to encourage our children to speak up if anything uncomfortable happens to them online, to build trust so that they know that they can come to us. We never want to violate that trust between our children, that they can come to us at any time and not be judged or get in trouble. Younger children should never post any personal information, including their name, phone number, postal address, schools, uh, their school, the photos, without consulting the parent first. Stay away from posting upcoming whereabouts, the whole, the whole premise of, of Facebook. People post absolutely everything about their life. Everything. Well, hey, look, they're going to be in Hawaii next week. Let's go bust their door down. Right? Stay away from posting too much information. Over a period of time, even the smallest details can offer insight into a bigger picture of your child's life. That ought to be an eye-opener. Never assume that private means safe. When a child posts a picture or a comment, they need to remember that they are transferring control of that thought, feeling, special moment, or image to all of the people that they are sharing it with. And there's nothing to stop followers and friends from sharing it with others. Social networks are a great way to connect with other people, but kids need to be consider carefully what they post on these sites. The internet is forever. 
It's forever. And that information that they post can be shared with anyone. There is no delete button on the internet. Kids should be taught responsible and respectful online behavior. They should consider what is this post, if they are posting on social media, what does it reveal? What is it telling people that might not know me, strangers? Again, avoid posting any personal information. Who sees it? Keep your privacy settings as high as possible. And how will this information be perceived now and in the future? A good, a good thing to say is if you wouldn't say it to somebody's face, don't say it on social media. Because you will have to deal with the consequences of that down the road. Our job as parents isn't to teach our kids about technology. We'd look pretty dumb if we had to do that. <laughs> but we need to teach them critical thinking and responsible behavior when accessing the internet. The really important thing is to be as, as involved in your child's life online as you are involved in their lives offline. Online bullying is a huge concern for most parents, and with good reason. 60% of all teens have been bullied online. And that may seem like it's not really a big deal, but it's the effects of online bullying. The effects of it are serious, sometimes often resulting in self-harm, depression, eating disorders, or suicide. The number one thing that, that people bully, uh, bully other people about online is their physical appearance. That impacts, it affects young minds. Nobody knows your child better than you, so be on the lookout for changes in their behavior. Difficulty sleeping, nervousness, and unwilling to, unwillingness to go to school or an event may be signs that your child is being targeted or bullied online. It's important for our kids to know that it's completely unacceptable, completely unacceptable to foster relationships with strangers online. And even more dangerous is hiding an online connection from your parents. Parents, you need to tell your kids that if someone is important to them, that they need to be important to you also. No matter where the child met them, they need to be important to the child and to the parent. Kids should never click links and messages from people that they do not know or messages that look suspicious. And they should not download files or apps to their phone or computers unless they are absolutely sure what they are. Let your parents know. In any case, it's a good idea for parents to periodically check in with our kids to know what apps, games, and websites children, children are using. Always have open lines of communication with your children. Build that trust with them. Privacy settings should be at the highest possible setting for each site your child is accessing. Set your device or whatever device they're using to filter explicit results. Services are also available to block pornography and other offensive material. You can purchase these, these other services, if you like, for your devices. For children ages 0 to 2, researchers recommend no screen time. None. Not a little bit, but none. Children older than two years should minimize consumption to no more than one to two hours a day across all devices, with more time allowed for educational activities, especially if adult interaction is involved. The bottom line is that we need to set limits for online screen time. It's not just have at her and spend as much time as you want. It's not just the first thing I do in my day, I get out of bed and I go turn the, turn the iPad on or the device on and just watch as much and just consume as much as I want. That's not how it is. And if you're not regulating the amount of time that your child is spending online, you need to. We need to set limits for online screen time. Devices are not babysitters. The more parent, child, pardon me, research has shown that more parents, the more parents are engaged in their own devices, the more parent-child interactions suffer. When parents break their poor digital habits, it makes it more feasible to correct their children's. What we do in moderation, Dennis Brown, our kids will do in excess. So set time limits for not only your children, but also for you. Limit non-productive screen time and make sure that the content that they are consuming is age appropriate. Heavens to Murgatroyd, whatever that means. Make sure that the content your children are watching is age appropriate. Set strong passwords for all devices and change passwords regularly. Children should never share their passwords even with their best friends. I'm about done in about two minutes here. It's a good idea to create online accounts for kids 
ask children to check in with you before accepting friend requests. Some apps will notify you if your child is receiving a new friend request, and you can monitor that. And I think that's a great, a great, uh, a great thing that, that, uh, that some apps are doing. It's accountable, creating a, a, a sense of accountability. And lastly, I know this might be hard for some, for some parents, but turn your internet off at night. <laughs> okay, so I'm preaching to myself here. Turn your internet off at night. Once the power bar stops glowing, no more decisions need to be made. There will be no more notifications and no more temptation to check email or social media just one more time, just one more time before going to bed. Why not leave the internet off for much of Sunday? Why not pick a, pick a day, a screen-free day or a screen-free time like mealtime or set screen-free screen -free areas like bedrooms, for example? I think that's a very important thing that parents should definitely set for their children, screen-free areas. Studies have shown that more parental rules, the more parental rules correlated with less risky online behavior with their children. So the more rules that you set, the less risks your child will face when they are online. As parents, it can be difficult to keep up. But as you want, just as you want to know where your kids are in their online or on their offline lives, you should know where they are in their online lives. Open communication with your children is the best route to finding out what they are up to to avoid the many dangers that social media and excessive screen time can inflict in our children. I've had a, a, a difficult time because it's a very heavy conversation, but it's an important conversation. And so what we're going to do is, is uh, I, wanna, I want, if there are children that are here, and I'll, obviously there's children here from two years old up to 17 years old. I want all kids, I want you to come up here. We're going to come up here and we're going to pray for you because it's important. Please take your time. <laughs> Parents, bring your kids up because you're going to be laying hands on them and praying for them. We're going to plead the blood of Jesus over them. This is so important, isn't it? If you have connections, if you love these kids, come up here and let's just reach out a hand and let's, let's plead the blood of Jesus over our kids right here in this place. This is so very important. The dangers that our children are facing today vastly outweigh any other time in human history that I can think of. And we need to be vigilant. So let's pray for our kids. Let's plead the blood of Jesus. And let's pray that their innocence is kept for as long as their innocence can be kept. I love all you kids. Hallelujah. And I believe that God is going to help us here today. Jesus. Jesus.